Thank you everyone for joining us today for Divided We Fall, how business can depolarize the US. This is a webinar series focused on political and social polarization in our country, specifically as a business issue. We're here to talk about the causes of polarization, the risks it poses to our businesses and to our country, and solutions that businesses can embrace to help address this critical issue. My name is Sarah Bonk. I'm the founder of Business for America. BFA is a business membership organization. We mobilize the business community to take action to increase civic engagement, protect voting rights, ensure election integrity, and combat polarization. We're proud to be partnering up with the Niskanen Center for this series. Uh, Niskanen Center in Washington, DC hardly needs an introduction as they are a storied institution with some of the very best thinkers working to advance an open society. I want to also say a quick thank you to our co-sponsors, Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives, New Hampshire Businesses for Social Responsibility, Civic Health Project, Bridge Alliance, and the Fulcrum for helping us get the word out about this series. So polarization is a deep and complex systems issue, and that's why we've broken the conversation into four parts. We hope you'll join us for the whole thing. In the first session, we did a broad overview of pol polarization with a particular focus on the current political climate. You can find the video on YouTube if you need to catch up. Today, we're focused on polarization as a cultural issue in our workplaces and our communities. In the next session, we're going to talk about how businesses may be incentivizing polarization with government affairs activities and political spending. And in the fourth session, we're going to talk about policy solutions to help depolarize politics and incentivize moder moderation. So let's start to dig in. When we are talking about society, culture, and politics, we also need to talk about how humans work and what drives our political beliefs. So preparing for today uh, reminded me quite a lot of when I majored in public policy in college and of course had to do a lot of research. But one study that really stuck with me all these years suggested that political attitudes seem to have a biological link. That was completely a new idea to me. We won't talk about how long ago that was. Um, I wish I could find that journal. But since that time, there have been numerous studies dem demonstrating that political attitudes have an equal or greater basis in biology than in environment and socialization. What we've learned is that Republican and Democrat minds are different, and we can see through neuroscience and behavioral genetics that our politics have a biological basis. For example, on a structural level, the brains of political conservatives tend to have a larger right amygdala, a region involved with detecting threats and responding to scary stimuli. And as a result, compared to liberals, conservatives generally react more strongly to an array of threats. And in fact, in one study, it was fascinating, um, researchers who looked only at the subject's brain scans could predict who was liberal and who was conservative with over 90% accuracy. It's wild stuff. Another key factor is that humans are tribal. It is primal, it's instinctual, and tribalism has been a biological mechanism that is essential to our survival as a species, and it has many upsides, but of course there are also downsides. And our group identities are subject to being manipulated and exploited through the political system, through the media, and it's important for us to note also through business and marketing. So, Beyond our biology and our instincts, what else is driving division and why are those divisions growing? Of course, there's a lot of reasons. Here are just a few. Uh, we need to look at the makeup of our society, how that's changing and how that can drive conflict. An increasingly fragmented media landscape where people are getting different information and different spin and profit-driven media needs sensationalism to get views. Social media and algorithmic targeting result in the creation of filter bubbles, geographic sorting as people move to live and work closer to people they already agree with, and of course the political system itself. We've seen a rise of movement politics, uh, some would say identity politics, and we need to also think about the way politicians often demonize the other side to get your donations and get your votes. 
The result is voters are more polarized. According to the Pew Research Center, Republicans and Democrats are more divided along ideological lines and partisan antipathy is deeper and more extensive than at any point in the last two decades. These trends manifest themselves both in politics and in everyday life. Certainly businesses are seeing the effects in workplaces across the country and grappling what, with what to do about it. It is, uh, there are no easy answers here. So how should businesses respond? As the country's political polarization enters into the workplace, what should company leadership do? Most of you have probably already heard about or familiar with the concept of corporate social responsibility. And this is a uh, key to how businesses are dealing with these issues. This used to be something for the vanguard of companies, expanding their purpose beyond just generating profit for shareholders to taking care of our society. Now, corporate social responsibility has become mainstream due to a wide variety of factors, especially employee expectations, and there's growing pressure on businesses to help address societal issues, many of which are highly politicized, highly polarized, it can really be a minefield. And so businesses are grappling with how to deal with these issues. We'd like to suggest that businesses consider evolving their corporate social responsibility to include a civic dimension. In the same way that communities need clean air and clean water, they also need politics to function well and allow them to implement public choices on important issues. We also need a cohesive social fabric where people can see beyond their, their differences and work together and find common cause. Overcoming polarization and addressing the strain on our society and the dysfunction in our political system is essential to our future as a country. Abraham Lincoln famously said, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. And we have been describing polarization as an existential threat. That's a loaded term, but when you look at history, you can see time and again, how division can lead to the downfall of our society. So in our view, American businesses have a duty to protect the future of our country and the democratic system of government that has allowed us to thrive and our civic culture that allows us to have a well-functioning democracy. And that's why we're having this conversation today. We hope that you'll be inspired to continue learning with us and to take action. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you to our awesome speakers. And with that, I'm going to hand the microphone to Richard. Please take it away. Great, good, thank you, Bonk. Good and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. So. Um, we have a great uh, set of speakers this morning, this afternoon, and uh, let me just quickly introduce them and then also offer some additional thoughts here. So um, not, not necessarily in the order that they're speaking, but uh, our first uh, speaker is Kristen Hansen, and Kristen is dedicated um, her work right now with the Civic Health Project to accelerating the efforts of academics and practitioners to um, help reduce toxic polarization and improve public discourse in America's citizenry, political world, and media. In addition to her role at Civic Health, Kristen serves as the co-chair of America Talks, which is taking place June 12th through 13th. We encourage you to go online and learn about that. She's also an advisor to, BF, to Business for America, All Sides and the Listen First Project. And in her spare time uh, is an adjunct lecturer of strategic communications at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Uh, Kristen also has a business background, having held senior executive positions at Intel, IBM, and a number of um, software startups. Um, secondly, is a, a, a I'm sorry, is, doc, is Dr. Tara Lewing, who's the vice president in corporate brand with Allstate. And Allstate, as you all know, is a national company with 10,000 agents spread throughout the nation. And Tara is responsible for the company's corporate communications, financial communications, thought leadership agenda, sustainability reporting, and reputation management. And she plays a key role in amplifying Allstate's voice in national dialogues about the race, uh, about the role of business in society. Um, she also has uh, a great uh, distinguished background in the military, having served 22 years 
of active duty in the US uh, Air Force, and also uh, worked for JP Morgan Chase for a number of years. And her final assignment before joining Allstate was working in the White House as a special advisor to uh, President Obama for European affairs and NATO. And then our third panelist is Allison Taylor. And Allison leads the ethical systems uh, program at uh, the New York School, uh, the Stern School of Business in New York City. And she has spent the last two decades dead, um, consulting to multinational companies on risk, anti-corruption, sustainability, human rights, culture and behavior, stakeholder engagement, ESG and ethics and compliance issues. She has previously worked uh, with the organization Business for Social Responsibility, Transparency International, Pricewater Cooper House, um, and also teaches at the NYU Stern School of Business. So welcome to you all. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. So just a few additional framing remarks to add to what Sarah uh, started with. You know, the role of business in navigating complex social issues is not new, but it has certainly become much more intense over the past few years and past decade. And if we think back, um, you know, to the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, business has weighed in on many different issues, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's climate change, gun control, food safety, um, gender related issues, income inequality. But what seems to be different these days is that while those were sort of standalone one-off issues that a company could navigate with the growth in polarization and divisiveness within our political system, companies I think now find themselves having to grapple with many, many issues simultaneously. And the strategy that companies are applying really may need to be adjusted. They may need new operating systems, new processes, new management um, systems in order to navigate both pressure from internal to the company, as well as from stakeholders outside. And what we wanna talk about in this uh, next hour is really how companies are adjusting to a rapidly changing business and political and social environment, the pressures they're facing, um, and then what systems and what examples can we point to that are helping companies succeed in tamping down the rhetoric, in reducing the conflict within the workplace. Um, and then finally, how might some of those internal mechanisms help the broader society within which we operate? Um, Bonk had mentioned about corporate social responsibility and just I was reflecting on my work back in the um, mid late 90s with Boston College's Center for Corporate Community Relations. And in those days, which seems like a long time ago, uh, corporate social responsibility had a much narrower focus and the role of business seemed to be much more uh, constrained. There was, I think, a um, less of an expectation that business would help to navigate societal problems. And as we're gonna talk about, there was probably less of an expectation that employees would bring all of their key um, issues to work. And, and in those days, uh, maybe it wasn't okay to, be, to bring your whole self to work. Um, but that has, has absolutely changed in, in the past 10 years. Um, the other point here that, you know, before we start is obviously the company is an extension of society. So it's really natural that companies have become home to the stressors and conflicts that we find in our communities, in our um, families, in our school boards, and really throughout society. So with that, um, Allison, let me turn to you first. And when you reflect on changes in the past decade, are there any other significant causal factors, maybe cultural factors, be it social media or otherwise, that you think have accelerated polarization in our, in our society at large? And anything maybe about the way we work 
that has also exacerbated polarization. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the causes for polarization in the US today are quite long running and quite structural. We heard about that very well on your first webinar. And I think what we've seen over the past decade is a bunch of accelerators. One of the most important, I think, is transparency. So uh, we could think about that in terms of the rise of social media, which I think has been a huge fuel um, to, um, to polarization. But businesses are also subject to far more transparency. It used to be that if you had a concern about something the business was doing, you would call the whistleblowing line. Today, employees are far more likely to leak damaging information onto social media. And something I'm very fond of saying is that leaders need to act as if everything they say or do might become public knowledge. So business leaders are acting in the public domain far more than they used to. I think the change um, that we've seen in business getting involved in polarized issues has been really dramatic in the last five years, more than 10 years. So if we look at 2014, there were riots in Ferguson over race issues. Companies would not touch this on the whole with a barge pole. Nobody said anything. Compare that to last summer and Black Lives Matter, when businesses were falling over themselves to, to make statements. We clearly, if we look at those as a bookend, see that something very significant has changed. The way I would characterize the change is that that, that neutral middle ground, which I think there's no question business prefers to occupy, has become a very, very dangerous place to be. So it used to be that businesses could say we're neutral, we don't want to get involved in this stuff, and their political spending under the radar might be a different issue. But that neutral middle ground has become just as dangerous as taking action. So now businesses are having to, to weigh between a lot of different risks. We've obviously also seen this rhetoric around stakeholder capitalism, which inherently, if you can't anchor your strategy to shareholder value, but have to anchor it to balancing a much bigger range of voices, there is this sort of idea we just balance stakeholder interests and that's all fine, but inherently that means, means making very, very difficult trade-offs. So a combination, I think, of, of uh, polarization, of, of transparency, social media, um, and then the rise of, of ESG and, and corporate responsibility, as well as the political climate, have really put business in this position today. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a lot of forces that are propelling change. Um, Tara, let me ask at all state, let me, let me go back to this issue of transparency. So, you know, we have come to accept that transparency is often a good thing, a necessary thing. It's a style of leadership and management, you know, open book management, full disclosure, employee resource groups. There's a lot of encouragement for transparency within an organization. But it seems that Allison is somewhat suggesting that increased transparency within the business environment might be possibly accelerating polarization in the workplace? Is that something that resonates, that, that premise? Does that resonate with you at Allstate? You know, it, it's, it's interesting. And what I would say from a very macro level, uh, the societal forces that are at work across the United States are, at, at work inside of businesses too, right? Like we, we represent uh, among our employees, the diversity of America, We're among our customer base, the diversity of America. As you, as you mentioned, Richard, we have agents in 10,000 communities across America. So it's, it's uh, very rare that you would be in a community and not have a local Allstate agent who is um, invested and building their business inside of a community. So we feel very connected to that. And of course we've been, deeply concerned about the polarization in society, how it's affecting us both internally and affecting us externally. Um, uh, and so what I, what I would uh, add to that is it does get to one step, the first step is being transparent about what your company stands for and how you're gonna show up in the world. And, there's some interesting research around there. So Richard Edelman uh, issues the trust barometer every year. He found in 2021 that among businesses and NGOs, media and government, 
that it is now business that is considered both competent and ethical. Uh, the other institutions didn't show up in that way. Right. He also has found year over year that there's an increased expectation for businesses to take a stand and for uh, CEOs to take a stand. Now, what's, what's interesting about that is that's not exactly the same question as should all state take a stand, right? Should mm -hmm. businesses writ large take a stand um, is a slightly different question than whether all state has, should take a stand. And so we we think a lot about that, that when we're a big name, we're a big brand, we're a Fortune 100 company, when we show up, our voice really does add to the conversation. And so when do we want to use that voice? Uh, and so we have been working um, and actually just finalized, quite frankly, a few weeks ago, our framework for determining when we take a stand. And it, it starts with our values. You know, we have, we're very uh, transparent, transparent about our values, which are encapsulated in something called our shared purpose, which is um, part of every communication we have and every sort of external facing communication where people can understand what, what our operating principles are, what our leadership behaviors are, what our values are, and we stand behind those. That's the starting point. Um, getting to stakeholder capitalism, then also thinking about what do our stakeholders ex expect? And of course, we have a range. We have everything from investors to consumers, to employees, to our agents, to policymakers, to opinion leaders. Uh, so we think about a range of stakeholders. And so they thinking about what do they expect uh, on certain issues? And then a third criteria for us is where are we uniquely credible? So obviously we're, we're, we protect consumers, we're embedded in every, uh, every community across America. And so we have a, a deep connection to what is the American consumer feeling and what are they worried about? And one of those things they're worried about is polarization. Um, but we're also uniquely credible based on some of our past work. So for example, uh, we're one of the few companies in America where our corporate foundation focuses on survivors of domestic violence. It's an ugly issue. Many corporations won't get involved. Um, but we have, and we've, it's one of the longest running CSR programs in the country. Uh, we've been involved in it for 14 years. And so when it comes to things like the Violence Against Women Act, we have a uniquely credible voice and we will bring that to bear in part because uh, our stakeholders expected, but it's also aligned to our values. And we have something really meaningful and impactful to say. Uh, same with youth empowerment, same with building codes, you know, same, same with protecting consumers um, uh, and helping them protect their most precious assets uh, and their families. And so it really gets down to where do you have the credibility to speak? And we think, you know, we just really think deeply about that. And then in terms of transparency, sharing that. So making sure in our annual reporting, making sure in our sustainability reporting, making sure when our executive speaks, when our executives speak, that we're standing for things and that we're sharing those things that we are taking a stand on. Uh, in addition to you know, all the pressures that businesses get today to share what they're thinking, what they're doing, how they're contributing. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to return uh, in, you know, in a little bit to this discussion about what criteria and methods companies use to decide what issues to weigh in on. But I wanted to go back for a moment and, and Kristen, bring you into the conversation to talk a, a little bit about how polarization is actually showing up in the workplace, right? So, you know, we, we see it um, in the media, we see contentious debates on Capitol Hill, we see uh, a number of people having a difficult time relating to each other. Um, effective polarization has grown where you know, the majority of parents in this country don't want their child to marry someone of a different political party. Um, and yet, when we think about how it shows up in the workplace, is it the same as it might be at the Thanksgiving dinner table? Or is there something fundamentally different in how it's manifesting in the workplace? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, you know, we started this discussion with a description of how polarization is showing up in society, and Tara did a nice job of bridging that into businesses and the different stakeholder communities. Uh, those voters across America, our electorate, call it, you know, 80 million, 75 million split, that schism shows up in our workplaces. And then it's a matter of how we behave and govern ourselves and set norms and guardrails around that schism in work settings. So I think, you know, by virtue of my opening comments, I'm gonna narrow the scope of what we're talking about even further for a moment to just the workplace. 
to organizations and how polarization is showing up within that stakeholder community, managers, employees, where there can be an awful lot of perspective diversity. So not only across different stakeholders like shareholders and customers, but just within the employee base, there can be a lot to think about. Tara talked a little bit about the demographics of Allstate, and I would imagine just by virtue of how Allstate operates within our country that if you were able to look under the covers, you might find a fairly even division across the political spectrum within all states employee base. I don't know, but possibly. Uh, but in many companies, that won't be the case. You know, as a country and as companies, we're very geographically sorted. That can lead to political sorting. And so in some companies, you may have a real skew where the employee base within your company skews more liberal minded, skews more conservative. And just starting with an element of mindfulness about that as a leadership team or as a business leader, I think is a really important first step to bring in consciousness about political polarization into your thinking about the workplace. Polarization is a form of division that, that can cause challenges within your workplace in a couple of different ways that it might show up for you, or perhaps it already has. Uh, would be that within your employee base, as you take action or make statements, and Tara described how important it is to ground that in values, an implicit assumption there is that as you define those values, they should, to the extent possible, be a reflection of, of the broad population of your company. But even when you do that, even when you act from values, it's important to understand that an action you take that can be supported perhaps by a wide cross-section of your employee base may not be supported by everyone. And do you have a way to think about that and respond to that as a company? So as you're taking action and engaging in the world, how is that landing on your employee base? And what is your plan to address that? The second way it can show up is even more direct and potentially harmful. And that is when employees bring their political divisions, that tribalism that we spoke about into the workplace, or even by manifesting their perspectives and opinions out in the world, perhaps through social media, they drive awareness of their political perspectives into a company where that then impacts relations between employees. This is another really important dynamic to be aware of, is how people's political opinions and expression outside the workplace can come in. It's another dimension of that transparency we spoke about. A lot of us, by virtue of being tribal, wear our politics a little bit on our sleeve. It's not as hidden as it might've once been. I'd start there. That's great. Good. And, and Chris, maybe we just relay the example of uh, of Basecamp, which a number of people may have read about, which, you know, the executive in that company, in an effort to probably reduce polarization right. and argument in the company, decided unilaterally that it was no longer okay to discuss politics in the workplace. And that created a minor revolt and uh, <laughs> led to a third of the employees leaving. And um, so, Maybe you know quickly tell that story, if you would. Yeah, sure. I and by no means do I want to pick on Basecamp. I think it's an important cautionary tale. It's in the press. You can mm -hmm. go out and read about it yourselves. It's a relatively small company and one that decided uh, from the leadership level that it was a good idea to kind of shut down political discussion on company-sponsored platforms. And now, on its face, that seems like a pretty reasonable decision to make. And I, and I definitely assume good intentions on the part of the leadership team in, in driving out through public corporate communications this message, no more societal and political discussions on our company Basecamp account. Today's social and political waters are choppy. These are difficult enough waters to navigate in life, but significantly more so at work. It's become too much. It's a major distraction. Now that seems on its face like a really sound business decision but it didn't work out so well for Basecamp. And it goes to the fact that employees have this very active voice. And, uh, and this prompted uh, what, what some in the press have described as a meltdown and a mass exodus within the company and from across a spectrum of political and ideological beliefs. And so it is important to really be thoughtful and intentional about how a company will grapple with diversity of perspectives within its workforce. Right, thank you. Uh, Allison, um, I know you've thought about the role of social media in creating more polarization, but also, you know, how might that, how might social media be um, cultivated or used more effectively within a company 
to reduce polarization. So I remember we had a chat where you were suggesting that, you know, if it's fine for people to post and express their views, like Kristen was just noting in a company, you know, in a company, but it can't, um, but the ability for people just to randomly say things without attribution or maybe accountability has led to further polarization in the workplace, it seems. So do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the base camp example was was super fascinating because I think Kristen's right. It was really well intentioned. It followed on from Coinbase before that, where the CEO said, we're just not getting into this at all. This is nothing to do with our values. Similar exodus, similar reputational um, damage. Uh, a company uh, in contrast like Expensify emailed all their clients and said vote for Biden, which is uh, also a really interesting uh, strategic decision. So um, what Basecamp and, and Coinbase did though, um, and what Basecamp did in particular was to, to say, we are shutting down this debate on our internal social media channels. And that's what um, caused the blow up because employees said, well, you know, um, you can't just delineate what's political and what isn't. Everything is political in today's world, diversity, me too, everything has a political dimension. So what I think companies need to be very careful about is replicating the kind of dynamics that we see out there on Twitter on their internal social media and Slack channels. I had a student in one of my classes last summer, I won't name the company, but they had had a diversity um, town hall with an anonymized chat function. And what happened while this town hall was going on was that a bunch of employees started posting racist comments anonymously in the chat, which obviously then was very difficult to address and caused a lot of um, internal turmoil. So that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want that same account anonymity working in your internal chat function. By contrast, uh, there was a company that, that said um, in response to this Basecamp event, it's not that we're going to ban you from discussing social and political issues um, on the internal chat, but if you are going to post something controversial, you need to also post a video explaining why you made that post. And if you're going to respond, you need to post a video explaining why you made that post. So given that social media works on outrage, it's very, very performative. This was a super behaviorally smart move to get people to slow down, consider what they are saying, and then take personal responsibility on video for it. And I think it's exactly that kind of a smart approach that we need to think about. A top-down effort to, to shut down debate is really not gonna work, not least because very often senior leadership has very different values from younger employees. So hierarchical disputes can show up as polarized disputes. But what I do think you need to do is make a lot of effort to make people think and reflect about the the impact of their words <clears throat> before they speak, things like conflict management, respect for others' values, drawing a bigger circle, all those kind of approaches are likely to be more effective than saying, we're just not going to debate these social issues internally anymore. Mm. Right, right. Tara, you want to add to that some examples from Allstate? I do. And I think... Um... I think uh, one thing we did last year is in, it sounds like uh, a, a, a complete opposite approach. So we actually very much encourage our employee base and our and agents who are, who are not employees, they're, they're independent contractors, they run their own businesses, but we encourage really strong participation in the political process. We're, we're in a company that is, is primarily, uh, we, we certainly sell only in the United States and, and Canada. And so this is where we have uh, our revenue coming from. It's, it's, we're, we're an American company at heart. And so we encouraged participation in the census, educated employees about the census, about the census, and encouraged participation. Uh, we uh, encourage people to learn about how they could vote and encourage them to go to vote, right? If they if eligible to vote in the United States, um, we very much um, we try and bring in speakers so that uh, who represent a wide range of views, um, so that people feel educated when they're going in and making these decisions and making decisions that, that do drive society. Um, and what we found in that is employees first are appreciative because they feel that they're better educated as they're engaging uh, in the political process. And they understand we encourage it. The, the place where we stop short 
in terms of the dialogue inside the company is we ask our employees not to endorse a particular political candidate because it just goes a little bit too far. But debating the issues, debating what's happening inside of their communities, um, participating in the political process, giving them time off, paid time off to participate in voting is something that we just think is fundamental to um, uh, to supporting our employees, but also just being a successful American business and being part of this American democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Allison had talked earlier about the importance of not replicating Twitter within your company. Uh, I think a, a positive point about companies is that we do have much, much better models to draw from and build upon in the workplace than what we see out in social media. And I think identifying and building from healthy models of engagement that already exist. You know, workplaces, frankly, are one of the places where people behave the best, right? We bring our best selves to work. We tend to get along because it's our bread and butter, right? Uh, the alternative is that we don't earn a living. And so uh, around that are wrapped many, many models for guiding that good behavior, building cohesive teams, fostering connection across different points of view. So we can leverage many of those existing models in a broader way out to encompass new forms of diversity, new forms of difference that exist within companies. And some of those models will include everything from just training and skill development, which exists in, in companies of any meaningful size, mediation, which is a skill set or a competency that exists within some types of organizations and could be built out further. And of course, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, which are already developed to account for forms of diversity within companies. But there's really an opportunity now um, not to take away from any of the existing focus areas that DEI initiatives already encompass around race, gender, possibly um, sexual or gender orientation or age, but to consider, and this is sort of the challenge or the consideration for folks listening on the panel today, um, could DEI, does DEI also need to contemplate additional forms of diversity, which could be geographic, which could be political or ideological, or just in the broadest sense, perspective diversity. And so when we think about building on existing models, I think there's a lot to draw from in the workplace today. So let, let, let's dig into that idea <clears throat> a, a bit further about the models that exist, the experience that businesses have in bringing a diverse group of people together for a common purpose. Um, and so um, Tara, you know, maybe if you could reflect at, at Allstate, you've had a program in, uh, in conjunction with the Aspen Institute and, and with better arguments which I think is focused really on getting people to be able to listen to each other's opinion, to become less reactive, to maybe check their own anger and frustration about someone else's point of view, and doing that within the context of respecting each other. And so to Kristen's point, what, you know, how does that model work within all state? And you know, what have you learned about better arguments that might be relevant to how other companies can navigate, you know, these contentions in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, you've touched on something close to my heart, which is the work we do with Aspen and facing history and ourselves on the Better Arguments Project. Um, as as I mentioned, you know, we are embedded in nearly every community in America, and we see the stress. And you know, the American Psychological Association even talks about this: the stress that Americans feel. Around, uh, around polarization in, their, in society and in their communities. Um, and so we uh, developed a program in partnership with Aspen and Facing History and Ourselves to really think about what would it look like to surface these disagreements, but do it in a way that's respectful and, uh, and, and is based in relationship rather than based in winning. Um, and it took us uh, a good three years to develop the program. I mean, this was something that we really had to think very intensely about. Think about how were we gonna show up from a brand perspective? What should the program look like? Uh, but I'm really proud that last September we launched the Better Arguments Project. And in the course of doing it, we developed sort of five principles around which 
um, diverse perspectives and people with diverse perspectives can, can engage with each other on issues where common ground may be, may be really tough. Uh, it starts with taking winning off the table, which is really hard to do, right? It's really hard to say, I'm gonna be engaged in conversation without trying to win the argument or win the day on this issue. Another is to really prioritize relationship to understand that uh, you're in a, that we'll be in conversation and dialogue right now we want to be in conversation and dialogue a week from now and two weeks from now and a month from now. So how am I going to engage with you in a way that's going to make sure that we have that relationship over time as opposed to this one time meeting each other, perhaps colliding in social media and never engage and never seeing each other again uh, and embracing vulnerability. So uh, we offer through Aspen uh, offer trainings around the principles of a better argument. We have also took this theory, these principles, and said, well, what does it look like to engage in communities on this? So we went, uh, we hosted an argument in Detroit. We hosted one in Denver to talk about some of the issues at play in those geographies, to your, to your point, Allison and Kristen. Uh, and then we brought it internal to Allstate to talk about um, what does it look like to argue inside the workplace. Um, and where we focus, where we have focused thus far is really teaching the principles around it um, and teaching you know, how can we behave with each other when we don't agree with each other and, we're, and recognize that we may even not find common ground in a conversation or even a couple conversations, but how do we abide by these principles when we're in dialogue. And so we just offered the other day sort of an exclusive training for our employees around the principles of a better argument to try and to do, as Kristen talked about, that skill building inside of the company uh, in conjunction with our inclusive diversity and equity team. Um, it's been transformative for us, but I will say it's it's hard, right? It, it was really hard to get to the point where we were uh, saying, we're ready to share this with the world. We're ready to put our name behind it. And we're ready to advance this because telling people that it's okay to argue, uh, as long as you argue in a respectful, uh, dignified way, um, that's not an easy thing to do. And we had to really make sure that we were ready to ready and had the support infrastructure in place to be able to support that. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> um, Allison, to build off of that, <clears throat> you know, I, I know you've thought a lot about the role of the executive within the company, he or, he or she, who is maybe modeling certain behavior, uh, trying to be actively respectful of these diverse opinions that people have. Um, but I'm reflecting on an example here before I turn it over to you of an executive who was describing how he had issued a congratulatory statement about the Black Lives Matter movement and protest last year. And while he got a number of accolades from his employees and throughout his operations, um, there were you know, a number of people who wrote back and said, well, what about Blue Lives Matter? Why are you deciding, um, you know, why are you speaking on our behalf and being disrespectful in their opinion? So to Tara's point about finding this middle path and encouraging people to express their views, but, um, uh, you know, but maybe the executive modeling some of that, how, how does that work? What advice could you offer an executive to sort of navigate this? I think we have to be really careful with this idea of CEOs as the new politicians. There was a lot of uh, rhetoric around this between around 2016 and 2018, the new CEO activists. And there seemed to be a general feeling like, well, we can't trust anyone in politics. Thank God somebody's stepping up. But I think CEOs need to be really careful about speaking on behalf of their employees and on behalf of their organization if there's not first been a very deliberate collaborative effort to determine what that organization's values should be. And Tara spoke to this uh, very compellingly a few minutes ago. She said that all state talks about the issues where it is uniquely credible. So I think you need to first of all go through an exercise where you determine what you, your values are, you determine what is relevant, you determine where you can have uh, the most positive impact, 
that process should be conducted in collaboration with your employees, not that you need to only listen to them. CEOs are not politicians, a workforce is not um, an electorate, but listening to your stakeholders, thinking about your business priorities, targeting things where you can have both a direct positive impact and that matter to both your internal and external stakeholders. And then you have a framework. And then I think you can stick to that framework and you can talk then about the things that are relevant to your business. CEOs may choose to speak out on their own behalf. There's very often a, a, a bit of kind of navigation going on. A lot of people just, um, a lot of CEOs spoke out about the recent verdict um, on George the George Floyd murder, and many of them um, spoke on their on a personal basis and not on the basis of their organization. So I think you need to be extremely cautious about um, when you use the CEO's voice to say this is what our organization thinks and represents. Um, and this is, is incredibly important, not just domestically, but internationally. I spoke with a bank um, that also spoke up on, on Black Lives Matter um, in the US last summer, and then immediately faced pressure from their employees in Hong Kong because they had not shown uh, an equal level of support for the protests in Hong Kong. So um, this is, this is um, you're going to raise expectations, you're going to raise a backlash and the best way to counter that is by figuring out where you can have impact, not trying to do everything and not opining on random issues that have nothing to do with your business or where they're not a priority for you. Right, right. I was, it, I was gonna, if I may, Richard, I was yeah. gonna offer a, another example or cautionary table. You brought up the Black Lives Matter example. Uh, and the reaction that ensued with employees saying, well, what about Blue Lives Matter? And going back a little further in time, and this was when I was still working myself at, at Intel, this was pretty early into the Trump administration and our CEO um, took an action that again, on its face might not have seemed political. It seemed like something that a CEO should do and would do. He went to the Oval Office and he held up a silicon wafer in a photo op with President Trump at the time. And, you know, that's the kind of corporate boosterism that would be maybe considered normal in more normal times. And it was really early into the Trump administration and, and maybe too soon to know just how polarizing uh, these years would become within our society. But believe me, there were early indications uh, based on how, how employees uh, showed up and reacted to that, where some were simply elated to see our CEO in the Oval Office and others were truly appalled. And seeing this dynamic play out within the company, I think, you know, management had to react and respond, but didn't really have uh, a plan in place because uh, leadership hadn't anticipated that taking an action like that, that would be a typical corporate action, maybe historically speaking, was going to cause that kind of an internal eruption based on where we suddenly were as a country. And so I think what you're hearing from, from all of us as panelists is the importance of getting out in front of this and really centering the positions you want to take as a company in values and recognizing that things that may not have had a political dimension in the past almost certainly do today. There's really not an issue that is not polarizing within our society. So baking that into your processes and always asking, what are the ripple effects of this action I'm taking out into my various stakeholder communities, starting with my employees? Right, right. And just as a reminder, the folks that are listening, <clears throat> you're welcome to uh, drop your question into the Q&A um, and we will get to as many of those as, as we can. Um, Tara, let me go back to you for a moment and sort of building off of, of Kristen's example there, you know, the definition of polarization seems to have shifted a bit over the past few years and now focus a great deal on the discord uh, between people on political views or what is actually true, you know, what is the truth? And so, you know, um, so when you when you reflect on the Better Arguments project, how have you factored in these very basic political differences, um, which is different than um, you know maybe issues of the past? You know even something like climate change. I may be a climate denier, or I may feel the federal government needs to be very active, but that is different than sort of this gestalt 
of a difference in one's whole political orientation, it, it seems. And how are you grappling with that more fundamental challenge within the company? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, Richard. Um, I would say, I'm gonna answer it in, in two different ways. In terms of the Better Arguments project, uh, one of the principles that we developed over the course of this work was pay attention to context. So there's an expectation that when people uh, have different points of view, it's coming from a lived experience, it's coming from a set of beliefs, and you, but those need to be made explicit, right? In order to really be in di rich dialogue with each other, you need to be willing to hear that lived experience, willing to hear that set of beliefs that the other person has. You need to kind of, in some ways, have done the work of know knowing your own so that you can engage at a level that's really going to be in relationship and dialogue. And that's going to uh, start from a point where you're just uh, of, of deep respect. <laughs> Right, of really recognizing that uh, that you to be in dialogue, you have to be engaging with each other in that way, and then also being open. The one of the other principles is make room to transform. So really be open to the idea that the other person's experience, the other person's belief, the other person's um, understanding of the world may shape your own. Right, like may 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 get you to rethink a, a view that you may have, or at least be open to that idea. Um, so it was, it's really fundamental to, to that work. I would say inside of the company, um, we work very hard to, as I, as I talked about before with our civic participation, to help uh, employees feel educated. So when we are uh, doing an internal communication, particularly around uh, inclusive diversity and equity, uh, we also always point to resources. So one of the big things we did in the past year was created an anti-racism resource center that's on our internet. And we point to it all the time so that employees can become more educated on the, on the issues in society. And we have heard over and over from employees how appreciative they are about a company pointing to resources where they can learn more and explore uh, either in community with, with their fellow colleagues or explore on their own. And so we constantly try and point to um, partners. Uh, for example, we have this long-standing relationship, as I mentioned, with Facing History in Ourselves that has done, that does intense work with classrooms on, uh, on the Holocaust, on the civil rights movement. And so really trying to point to those sort of resources where, where employees can learn more. And if you start from that, that basis that we're gonna have a point of view, we're gonna share it, um, with our employees in particular, uh, we're one of the companies that's probably not first to put out a statement. In fact, we're never first to put out a statement. And part of the reason for that is one, the, the listening to employees, but also um, we think that our actions speak louder than our words. And so we spend a lot of time talking about, well, what can we actually do? What is an action we can take in response to this situation that goes beyond just expressing support for this or expressing an opinion on that, but actually points to an action we're gonna take. And that I think has guided us. It does mean we're not out in front. It does mean we're not first, first on Twitter or first on Instagram, but uh, we think it's actually more meaningful and more impactful because when we come in, we say, these are the three things we're gonna do. And here are some th three resources that you as employees have access to so that you can learn more uh, on this topic. Tara, right. it goes back to the issue of trust, right? This is such an important point that with trust so low as, as evidenced by the Edelman barometer and other sources, trust so low in many civic institutions, in media, uh, businesses, workplaces, and leadership of companies is one of the places where people do still have a very high level of trust. And so leveraging that trust in the service of pointing people towards factual, well-sourced, well-grounded information is a really important, healthy society role that companies can play and hopefully are playing. Right. Um, I wanted to pick up on a question here that Marianne Lucas um, has posed, which is you know, something we think a lot about at Business for America, which is the role of, biz of business in helping to stabilize, strengthen, protect our representative democracy. And, you know, clearly over the past number of years, we have seen a growing segment of the population in this country and other, you know, advanced industrial economies 
questioning the value of a democracy. And, you know, increasing number of people think that maybe an authoritarian um, would be a better model for the US to have, you know, a strong, strong leader or the military. And so, you know, polling data suggests that there are a number of uh, strong indicators that people prefer that as a, as a style. So the question really, and Alice, and I wanna bring you in here, the question is, you know, what's the role of business in helping to talk about the value of democracy? Because that's certainly the form of government we have and how we define um, our democracy is a key element here in polarization. And it, you know, the past few years in particular, has there been a number of threats to our democracy, you know, whether it's the, the questioning of the election outcome or the January 6th insurrection have really threatened the core of, of how this country works. So do you have any thoughts of, um, about yeah, that, that big question? Uh, <laughs> I certainly do. I, I mean, I don't think that there is any debate, doubt or any debate that democracy is better for business. It's better for investment. It's better for the economy. It's better for predictable policy. I mean, a very polarized democracy, we don't have predictable policy, but none of this is in the self-interest of business. And to my earlier point that business should discuss things that they can personally impact, clearly a functioning democracy is relevant to, to um, all businesses. I think this is not really needed stating until the past couple of years. It's been more important for business to use its voice and make its decisions on um, particular policy outcomes that favor its interest. But we now do find ourselves in a situation where this, I mean, reliable health information might be another uh, very good example where maybe business um, does need to kind of take a position here. Um, I don't I appreciate this has become a polarized question, but I think we need to separate electoral politics from what the vast majority of people in America want, even if this alienates a small proportion of people that would like an authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a recent comment saying that we should have a, a coup like we did in Myanmar. Um, I mean, what's happening in Myanmar, in fact, is that the general population is rising up and saying they would like to get rid of the military and have a democracy. So um, really good illustration of why we don't, in fact, want to be like Myanmar. So um, I think that's one point. And then I think what I would try and do, though, is to um, kind of depolarize that conversation and really look at the role of business. I mean, one of the drivers of polarization in the US is obviously this geographic sorting where we just don't get to know each other. We have a lot of effective polarization. We really dislike each other, partly because we don't run into each other and we don't have to converse. So business is one of the last places that can create a civic space where they can bring people with different values together. Peter Coleman, the, the conflict specialist at, at Columbia, um, brings together people with different views and, and tries to create conversations in a, in a way that sounds quite similar to what Allstate is doing. And what he had, what he's found in his research is it's not enough just to put people in a room um, and get them to have a conversation. They start to get on a lot better if they do a task together, like gardening or repairing something or focusing on something. So business has, I think, an opportunity to disrupt these group dynamics, disrupt this in-group, out-group behavior, and try and create cross-cutting teams and cross-cutting efforts where people can work together and get to know each other as human beings. So at this point, I think business has got a real responsibility, and I don't think we should see um, defending democracy as, as, as something that um, is controversial. Um, I, I at least hope we're not there yet. <laughs> Boy, I couldn't agree more with what Allison was just saying about, you know, taking a stand, but then depolarizing the conversation. It's this blend. And I had written down uh, just a short while ago, this notion of bright red lines. I think what we've seen over the past, you know, year, year and a half is as a society, as individuals, but also as companies, we're, we're hitting up against what I would describe as these bright red lines. And for, for some leadership teams, the George Floyd murder was the bright red line. We have to take a stand. We have to be public about this. For others, it was around voting access, access to the, uh, the voting booth, both um, 
as an issue before and after the election in November. And then for others, it was January 6th. So we've had this rapid succession of what I would describe as these bright red lines where a, a leadership team is like, well, we can't not say anything here. We have to take a stand, right? And you know, reaching that conclusion um, leads you down a path, right? And so then the question becomes, can you, as a, as a leadership team, take a stand uh, and bring as many of your stakeholders along with you in that decision as possible? And this is where I would reinforce again, this notion of, of considering mediation skills, listening skills, bridging skills, the importance of developing those, cultivating those within the leadership level and also within your employee base more broadly. Uh, as well as a, a related concept that I would describe as, um, well, <laughs> basically bending over backwards, bending over backwards to suss out the diversity of perspectives across your stakeholders. Be intentional about this. It, ideological diversity is not as obvious as racial diversity. You can't see it, but it's there. How are you going to know what it looks like? how it breaks down, how it shows up. You have to be very, very intentional about that or be prepared as a company to react like a deer in a headlights when a stand that you've chosen to take has volatile consequences, whether so, that's in your employees or, or we haven't really talked a lot about customers, but of right. course that's another critical stakeholder community and we've seen this play out as well. Taking those stands can have ripple effects in your customer base too, obviously. Right. Richard. Yeah. Let, 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 let's talk uh, just for a moment about um, determining what the response might be, right? So, you know, most companies don't canvas their employees or stakeholders before they take a stand, right? You know, for a number of obvious reasons. But it goes back to Allison's point about materiality and, and Tara's point. You know, the company can't weigh in on everything. And I think as Tara said to me in a previous conversation, you know, people will like or dislike us regardless of what we do or, or some variant of that. And you know, our, our job ne isn't necessarily to make everybody happy or that might be our goal, but it's not likely to work. So um, any of you who have a thought on this, you know, what is a approach, you know, very practical hands-on approach that a company could take to determine whether taking a stand on an issue, uh, how that's going to resonate with employees. You know, I, I, I know of a number of high tech companies that have taken stands on issues, but who have, you know, left the impression with more conservative employees that the company doesn't care at all about those employees' views. So how, how does a company really navigate that? Any suggestions or, yeah, Alison? Yeah, so um, I think there are a couple of things here. Um, one is, is as we've been discussing, though we haven't named it yet, this idea of materiality and, and Tara described this. She described that, that Allstate has certain priorities. Those are priorities that are directly relevant to the business, directly relevant to its stakeholders, including employees. So the idea here between behind any corporate responsibility or ESG effort is that you don't speak up and you don't do stuff on every possible issue out there. You determine the, the overlap in the Venn diagram between the issues that are business relevant and the issues that show up for your stakeholders. Historically, a lot of these exercises have been done by interviewing and surveying a bunch of external stakeholders, so customers, investors, suppliers, nonprofits, and then doing um, interviews with senior leadership on the business strategy. I think you can very much canvas employees as part of that effort. I think it's quite important that's done anonymously. A lot of dynamics, particularly in tech companies, are in, 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 again, the same as on Twitter. They prioritize extreme views, they prioritize loud views. I feel like I have this conversation with different people in different contexts three times a week. How can we make sure we are listening to what people really think rather than the loudest and most opinionated and most extreme views in, in any situation? I'm working with government finance officers at the, say, at the moment, they have the same issue with the general public. So I think you can take employees temperatures as part of that effort and then you set your priorities and then you really stick to that narrative. Even more importantly though, 
let's not confuse taking a stand and having an opinion with actually doing something. So Tara said this, she said, we don't speak out unless we're also going to take action. And so once you've identified these priorities, it's not just about what you're saying um, kind of out there on social media. And this has kind of shown up with diversity, right? There's been a lot of critiques for companies saying, here's our black square, here's our support for Black Lives Matter, here's a bit of data. But we, you know, we uh, still have a really bad um, kind of balance of social identities in the C-suite and the employee base. So if you're going to speak out on something, you better make sure that your political spending is uh, aligned with that. I think that's going to come up in the next session. Mm -hmm. And you better ensure that you can support your rhetoric with some action. And if there's no um, constructive action that your business can take, I would really question whether you should be speaking up on that issue. So um, gather perspectives, sure, they are not the only perspectives, your employees are not the electorate, but certainly take them into account, provide a safe space for people to do that, but then ensure that you can match your rhetoric with some actual concrete action. Otherwise, I, I really would shut up. And I think what I would build on what Alison's saying is, and exactly what you said, Alison, that creating that safe space, creating psychological safety in the culture so that issues can be surfaced. So we're a, we're a company that's very networked. We have, we have strong ERGs who are going to surface issues. We've built inclusive diversity councils across many of our business areas who are helping us think about this. And the idea of taking a stand, the idea of needing to do something really can come from anywhere. And then it's about having an inclusive process uh, through the decision making, which frankly is going to happen uh, for certain things at the most senior levels, but those voices need to be represented in that conversation. And they can't be represented if there's not the psychological safety for those issues to be surfaced. And I'm not saying we, we do it perfectly. I mean, there's, that is hard work. <laughs> Right. It is hard work to have uh, inside of a system where employees on the front lines feel comfortable surfacing uh, things that are that make them uncomfortable and propose solutions to it. Um, but if we can bridge through things like ERGs, bridge through having that dialogue among the most senior leaders and among the frontline employees, it, it creates more opportunity for that conversation to happen and for those perspectives to be shared. Right. I, I do just want to acknowledge, you know, based on what Allison just said, that next, a conversation we're having in two weeks, the third of the four-part series here, will dig into um, companies' engagement in, uh, in political spending and this issue about being consistent or inconsistent. So you may have an internal policy and speak out on a given issue, but a company may still be contributing um, to a candidate who, because of other commercial interests, is supporting their needs, but may be inconsistent with some other stance that the company feels strongly about. So we are going to dig into that issue. Um, so I'm, I, I see there are several questions here which ask about elections and donations and campaign contributions. So um, that is the next topic we'll talk about um, in two weeks. Um, I did want to pose this question, sort of the build on this most recent conversation that Shannon Watson asked, which is this compulsion to have to take a stand, you know, may come or does come from a sense that if you're silent, you're complicit. And, you know, we have seen, uh, particularly around the voting rights issues at the state level in Texas and Georgia and a number of other states most recently, that companies that did take a stand, you know, belatedly, you know, maybe late or or not soon enough, uh, were criticized. Um, but they were also criticized by um, a number of senior Republican senators who suggested that they were just participating in woke capitalism. And so, you know, it's uh, the it's difficult for the companies to make everyone happy. That's for sure. But um, Tara, do you have anything you'd like to say about this, you know, being in the messy middle and having to find um, strategies to appeal both to employees' concerns, but also this broader public that you're constantly thinking about? Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's hard, Richard, right? It, it's actually hard work. You talked in the beginning about some of the Pew research and, uh, 
And if you look at the Pew research about where, say, the center of mass of the right and the center of mass of the left are today, uh, during the Clinton era, strong overlap. You know, you, you look at the you look at the Venn diagram as Allison talks about, and there's a lot of overlap. You look at that same uh, you look at those same surveys today or four years ago, and the overlap is very small. So the the the, the country has clearly become more polarized. And when I talk about the messy middle, sometimes. Um, uh, our, our head of uh, government affairs in, in Washington and I did an article uh, in Aspen where we talked about it may not be possible to unify, <laughs> but at least we can have dialogue around unifying, right? Like we can be in better dialogue rather than expecting to unify off the bat. Um, and I say, you know, I talk about like, I think we're in the messy middle of trying to rebuild the center. One thing that's, that wasn't an all-state initiative, but is something that's very connected to us because our, our CEO was also chair of the chamber for two years. Um, he was the first, uh, first chair of the chamber, actually was kept on for more than a year. And, and in part of that work and in, his, in working with the chamber, uh, the scorecard for the chamber had a number of considerations when they were trying, when they were de determining their political spending, uh, bipartisanship and supporting bipartisan issues and working in a bipartisan way was not part of that. Um, it is now part of the formal score, scorecard that the chamber uses, which they launched, uh, which they launched last year, and that really comes down to leadership and a decision that there should be some um, credit given to uh, to lawmakers who are going to act in a bipartisan way and work across the aisle on issues. Um, but we're we're on a long road. It's it's. Uh, Given everything that Pew has showed us about where America is, getting back to, to that of having more overlap between the left and the right is uh, is it's going to be a journey, and it's going to be a generational journey. And all of us can commit to doing things along the way, like changing the chamber scorecard, that help with that. But it's going to have to be an all-in effort, and it's going to have to happen at every level and in every uh, in so many different conversations. Right. I think that's a good point because there are those who, you know, think that we'll just go back to what it was in, you know, in, in the good old days um, in 2016 and uh, people will start behaving themselves and the rhetoric will get tamped down. But you're suggesting that this phenomenon of a polarized society and the messiness of that is going to be with us for a while. And that it sounds like you're suggesting businesses really need to come up with longer term strategies for dealing with it. Yeah. That's that's definitely my personal personal view on it. I think that this is the work of a generation. Right. Right. Kristen, you want to add anything to that thought? Well, I was I was listening to Tara as she was talking about rebuilding the center. And something that uh, we think about a lot at Civic Health Project is that there are a couple of different types of divides to consider in this in this work that we're engaged in this generational work. There is this ideological divide between people who for biological or, or tribal or whatever reason identify more as leaning one way or another way politically. So that is one type of division we're grappling with. There is another division we're grappling with, I think within our society, which is between those who wish to sustain the fight, the mm -hmm. division, and those who wish, wish to bridge across it, or what you could describe as a propensity to bridge, this is a different kind of division that we also have to grapple with, that there are different sentiments that are competing for primacy right now. One is that we get to better outcomes in our society by fighting each other, and the other is that we get to better outcomes by learning how to bridge to one another. Now, I, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think it's we're, that we're going to get to the answers by just going down one of those paths. We probably need to go down both simultaneously, but it is another tension to grapple with because whether people lean left or lean right, they all have a different level of propensity to engage in the kinds of healthy actions that we're talking about here. A better argument, bridging across divides. Some people are wired for that and others not so much. And that isn't a political identity. That's about a different kind of propensity. So I would, I would ask businesses who, who have the opportunity, again, to build these foundational skills, 
it's not about trying to train your workforce to lean a certain way or your employees to lean a certain way, but to embrace bridging as a path forward and to learn those skills, develop that propensity to connect, to bridge, to mediate differences. This, this really uplevels all of our society and doesn't require that we come to agreement on any specific political issue. So, so you're suggesting, which I agree with, that businesses can step up and assume more responsibility for actually providing that training. You know, maybe that's something that people didn't get at home. Maybe they didn't get it in high school. Uh, they may not have got it elsewhere. Maybe they got it in the military, in their service. But given the prominence of business in our society, you're suggesting that training programs could be set up and companies could be guiding this process about learning much how to like learn. the Much like mm -hmm. the better arguments model and mm -hmm. example that Tara mm -hmm. was describing, yes. Uh, but I, I want to, so I'm a capitalist <laughs> and I recognize companies will do this because it's in their self-interest. So it starts from the premise that engaging in this work, investing in it is in the, is in the self-interest of the corporation. Uh, because it cultivates a healthier workforce, healthier right. communities, yep. uh, a healthier relationship with customers and other stakeholders. That's why you would do it. Uh, and, and so yeah. I think this whole conversation is kind of a consciousness raising effort to say, these dynamics probably are already playing out in your employee base, in your customer base. Start from a, a position of awareness so that you can be more intentional and make the right kinds of investments that you think will, will broaden uh, your I don't know if appeal is the right word, but your ability to connect across your employee base and across your customer base as well. Right, right. Because we certainly know that the acrimony in the workplace and around the water cooler has hindered product, you know, productivity, has you know, um, impaired employee, employee performance. It's made it difficult in a number of companies. You know, we've heard over the past year or two um, yeah, and it, 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 it is in certain cases creating a new form of hostile workforce, and that can be right. very subtle or it could be very extreme, but you know, we're all accustomed to thinking about the hostile workplace from a mm -hmm. sexual harassment mm -hmm. perspective, but um, people can feel they're enduring a hostile situation for all sorts of reasons, and one of those could be political or ideological diversity. Right, right, okay, good. We had talked very briefly, just mentioned about um, other stakeholders, so customers, and the communities within which companies operate. So Tara, what thoughts do you have about, you know, um, sort of recognizing that customers too, when they work with an Allstate agent or any representative of a corporation, um, you know, have their own political orientation, and they may be carrying that bias with them, and may make their decision about what company to patronize based on what that company says or what their perception of that company's politics are. So how are you all thinking about that challenge? Yeah, and it is, uh, as you put it, it, it is a challenge and, and also an opportunity. Um, it's something that we, we think very deeply about. What has changed even in the past 12 to 18 months is, um, is this fact that saying nothing um, can create as, can sometimes create as much negative sentiment as saying something. And that's new, uh, that's new for business. Uh, yeah, Kristen, you talked about this, the, the neutral middle that businesses were, were able to take for, for quite a long time is becoming less and less of an option. And that's where I think, you know, as Allison pointed out too, it really gets down to doing the work of understanding what what your values are and how that translates into what you will stand for. Um, and so you just, you, um, I just encourage companies to, to do that work to, and to engage many stakeholders in that work. And also, you know, look for, look for opportunities. I, as you mentioned, Rich, I also lead our sustainability team. Um, our, the fact that we are, uh, have, are really strong in our sustainability disclosures is motivating for some consumers. And hopefully actually gives us a, a you know, to Kristen's point, uh, a competitive advantage in the marketplace. We do it because it's right. We also do it because it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. And there's this added bene, bene, benefit of that. 
Um, but it's it's tough to navigate, and it's just something that we we constantly think about. We constantly think about after the Edelman work comes out. It's great that uh, consumers want businesses to take a stand. What do they want all state to take a stand on? And that those are two different related but two different questions. And so we think about that very deeply all the time. Right. <clears throat> Allison, I have a question for, for you um, that comes uh, from Shannon Watson, and I'll summarize this, which is that, um, you know, clearly within our political environment, um, elected officials are necessarily setting a good example of having a better argument. Um, and so, you know, it, it the, the question I have is, you know, what can we what can the business community demonstrate as far as effective ways of communicating and dealing with conflict that we might be able to pass on to those in the political arena? And maybe the second part of that question is any suggestions on, you know, what are effective um, strategies for business to use to try to re reduce the rhetoric in the political environment? You know, is simply taking a stand on an issue uh, enough, or is there something more that business leaders and businesses might do? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, again, if we are if we are at the point where the business is taking a stand, by which we mean making a public statement that then other public figures are going to react to, that is unlikely to tone down the rhetoric. So, um, back to this point I started at the beginning of this session uh, transparency while an extremely positive thing in many directions just to be clear I'm pro transparency but having all debates on the public stage where we're already in a situation where extreme voices are greatly amplified I don't think we want to accelerate or add to that so there may be very good opportunities for business to use their voice behind the scenes to try to depolarize to try and show their commitment to democracy um etc cetera, etc cetera. then i think you know back to everything tara said and everything we've discussed already about being very intentional about setting your values research shows that if you demonstrate pr procedural justice so showing the reasons for your decision um so then it is easier for people to accept that decision if even if they don't personally agree with it and then interactional justice so being civil and responsive and listening and not asking for input if you're not going to do anything with it both those things can go a long way to um kind of reduce polarization and i think there are values that you can set that are um depolarized and depolarizing um and um i kind of go back to to kristen's point about um this all being in businesses self-interest i mean to be a successful leader in any business today one of the criteria should be I am able to work successfully with people I personally dislike and have different values from me. I am able to make those teams work. I'm not completely caught up in my opinions. That's a great skill set to train everybody on. I would encourage young employees to say, you better get comfortable with this stuff. This is going to show up in your career. And if you can navigate these things, if you can protect vulnerable employees, but if you can do that without making the white men in your team feel guilty and anxious and angry, you sure are gonna have a successful career. So let's kind of build these skills, be very explicit about how they are a career advantage and a business advantage. Certainly everybody I work with in the classroom completely understands this and is able with a bit of priming to have a very, very respectful dialogue. So I find it hard to believe we can't make this work in a business where people come together for a shared mission that is not about polarized issues. So again, kind of really trying to disrupt that and business using its advantage as a depolarizing force. And the so virtuous cycle, the virtuous cycle that creates Allison, of course, is that then once those skills are developed, those employees take those skills back out into the rest of their lives, right? So the work, you know, again, a workplace will take this on once it recognizes it's in the company's interest, but it does still have this reverberating positive benefit for society. Right. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you all. That was a fascinating conversation, much to be um, thought about here. And we really appreciate all the questions and, uh, 
Kristen, Tara, and Allison, thanks a great deal for your input here. Um, we are going to, as uh, Sarah Bonk is going to describe, continue this conversation um, in two weeks. And uh, Bonk, I'll turn it back to you. Right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, um, all of our attendees, the speakers. This is a really interesting conversation. I'm so excited to see where we go with all of this information next. Um, as we've alluded to several times, uh, there is more to the conversation. So uh, coming up on June 17th, we are gonna be talking about something that came up today and that is how businesses are contributing to polarization through their government affairs activities, through their political spending and how you can align your business purpose, your principles, your values with your activities. This has uh, been a tough challenge for companies for a long time and only increasing now in light of January 6th. And those events um, have really highlighted this as an issue for business. And then of course, on June 29th, we'll be talking about policy solutions, how we can depolarize politics and incentivize moderation and why that's in business's interest to support those policies. So really hope folks can join us for those. Um, you can find the next one at dividedwefall3.eventbrite.com. We made that real easy for you to get there and sign up. We do hope that you will join us and want to thank the Scannon Center again for their partnership on this and hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>